certainly a pleasure to be here with you this evening, and I appreciate so much the invitation to come. I don't believe I've ever been here before, although I'm not sure I know where I am. So. <laughs> but I do recognize a good many faces in the audience that are familiar to me from other places, and it's certainly good to see you. I look forward to studying just these few lessons with you, and uh, it is just a few, and I, I think I'm kind of conscious the older I get that uh, a lot of places I'm not going to get back to now. I always want to try to preach everything when I get there, but we'll try not to do it at one time. But I am going to preach some rather general lessons to you that I think teach us a lot of very important things about being Christians, about how to be Christians, and what it means to be one, and how it is that those of us who set out on that course can be successful in fulfilling our mission to the end. And it's in that setting that I'm going to talk with you some this evening about the third chapter of the book of Colossians. And that chapter is about as thoroughgoing a kind of an exposition of how to end up being a Christian as I would know how to turn to in the scriptures. And I want to suggest to you that the first four verses set out two bases upon which to build a Christian life. And they say, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now before I talk about the two attitudes that I believe ought to be the basis upon which we build our Christian lives, let me acknowledge that when we read Colossians, the third chapter, it, it begins with an if. And that is, if ye then be risen with Christ. And I expect that there are people here this evening who have not been risen with Christ. And so everything that we say subsequently rests on that proposition, that where you begin is you begin by being risen with Christ. And that will form the basis of our lesson this evening. But if you're in this audience and you're not a Christian, if you have not been born again, then I want to go back to the second chapter for just a moment and read a few verses that explain where Colossians 3 began. Beginning in verse 10, the Apostle Paul said, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, I, I'll tell you what we're about to study this evening is a passage that essentially, I believe, describes the completeness that we have in Christ. That we have forgiveness of our sins, that we're circumcised and set apart, not in some sort of fleshly way, but because we're Christians. And when you become Christians, what that does is that makes you complete. And we can just be all that God would have us to be. But there's a beginning to that. There's a way to start that. And so reading on, he says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Now, that's where chapter 3 begins. It begins with us being risen. But it starts back there in chapter 2 with us completing our faith and being buried with the Lord in baptism and then risen to walk a new life. And so it may be that you're here this evening and you've never done that. And that is precisely the experience that Jesus described as being born again. And we'd urge you at the end of the lesson, if you've never been risen with Christ, to come forward and confess faith in Him, repent of your sins, and be buried with Him in baptism. And then to be risen with Him, to walk in the way that we're going to look at in the third chapter of Colossians. 
Well, all right, let's turn back then to Colossians 3. And let me suggest to those of you who are Christians this evening and those who are not, who would understand how it is that we can be what we ought to be, the two propositions that he says you have to build your life on. And the first one in verses 3 and 4 that I want to suggest to you is that a Christian, if you're risen with Christ, that what you do is you build your life on a new understanding of who you are. That if you're risen with Christ, you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. I want to tell you, people talk a lot in our time about identity crises. That is, people have a hard time figuring out who they are. And I believe that's true. You know, most places I go, I, I'm impressed by how uh, uprooted people are. Now, I don't know. It, it may be that there are a lot of people in this audience this evening that have more or less lived in the same place all your life. But I, I sort of that. And most people have not. You go preach in a typical urban church and uh, probably nobody has lived there more than three or four years or not many of them have anyhow. And that's the way it is in this country. We're uprooted. People ask me where I'm from all the time, and I, I hardly know how to answer that question. I, man, I've lived in Birmingham for three years. Before that, I lived in Arkansas. Before that, I lived in Alabama. And before that, I lived in Oklahoma, I think, Georgia. And before that, Oklahoma. Before that, Texas. And I can tell you where I've been, but it's hard for me to figure out really where I'm from. I lived in India for a year one time, and... Uh, it was always interesting to me the way somebody in India would answer that question if you asked them where they were from. They would say, I belong to Delhi or I belong to Bombay or something like that. And every time one of them answered me like that, I'll tell you what went through my head was, well, I wonder where I belong. <laughs> but I, I will tell you that I've got an answer to that. I'll tell you where I belong. I belong right here because we're Christ. And I belong with folks who are Christ. And if you know who you are, what I want to tell you is I believe that'll have a powerful impact on your life. And that's what it means to be risen with Christ is that you change your character. And who you think you are has a whole lot to do with how you behave. I travel a lot. One of the things I do when I sit around in airports is just sit there and watch people. And I'll tell you, that's interesting. And what you will see is you'll see almost everything. I mean, here's some fellow will walk by and he's got cowboy boots on and a cowboy hat and he thinks he's John Wayne. And somebody else will walk by and he'll be dressed like Jack Nicholas and pretty soon one will come by in such a garb that I don't know what he thinks he is, you know, but 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 I'll tell you, it, it, it has something to do with who he thinks he is. And your life and your behavior will be determined by whether you think you're a, a vamp or whether you think you're some really important person or whether you think you are Christ. And what he starts this chapter with is the assertion that is, if you're risen with Christ, then one of the things going to change about you is your identification. And you're going to say, it's no longer me that's living, but it's Christ that's living in me. Well, all right, the second thing he says, that you'll build your Christian existence on, and that you'll have a firm understanding of where you're going. In verses 1 and 2, he says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. Now, I will tell you another thing that will have a lot to do with how you behave yourself is what you have set out for your goals. Now, I've told the story for four or five years now about goal setting that I learned when I got a letter some years ago from Holiday Inn, 
And I got this letter from Holiday Inn, and it said, we're starting this uh, system where every time you stay in a Holiday Inn, we will give you a point and we'll keep record. And when you stay in enough Holiday Inns, we will send two people anywhere in the world and put you up free for a week. And so I went and ran and got my Holiday Inn book and started looking at all the places there were Holiday Inns and I found one in Scotland, which is where I like to go better than any place. And I said, well, I believe I'll just do that. And then I read the fine print, of course, and discovered no ordinary human being could do it. But, uh, but since I don't live a very ordinary human being life, I set out to do that. And I want to tell you, I've stayed in a lot of Holiday Inn. And I would go every place I'd go preach, I'd stay in the Holiday Inn, or any time, any other time I traveled, I'd stay in it. And if I went to preach someplace, and there wasn't a Holiday Inn there, I'd stay 25 miles away in the Holiday Inn, and drive back and forth. And one time, they got where they'd give you double points if there's two people. So every time I went, I'd make somebody go with me so I could get double points. And a few times, nobody would go with me, and I got somebody there to stay with me so I'd get my double points. I ended up spending the night with some people I didn't like very well. But I'll tell you what I did. I got my points. And we went to Scotland. And I'll tell you what, that's a lesson. That's a lesson in gold set. If you want something bad enough, I'll tell you what you you'll do a lot of things to get it. I mean you'll go out of your way to get it, and you'll work at it if you really want to get it. But I I'll tell you what I really understand. Is it where I want to go? It's not as God. Where I want to go is heaven. That's where I want to go. And what this passage says is, if you're risen with Christ, the thing you got to get in your mind is where you're going, that you're trying to go to heaven. And if you end up being the kind of person you ought to be, it'll be because you know who you are and you know where you're going. And if you get those two things straight, then what you have is you have the basis upon which to build a life. And I want to tell you, if your goals are the wrong goal, then your behavior will be the wrong behavior. And if you got yourself identified as the wrong kind of person, then you won't be the right kind of person. But the very heart of what it is to be a Christian, he says, is that you obey the Lord and you become a child of God and you're buried with Him in baptism and then you're risen, changing your identity and knowing who you are and getting your eyes set on where you're going. Now, what I want to do is read the rest of the third chapter of Colossians with you and suggest to you that what we got before us is the solution to every problem if we're just using it. Verse 5 says... Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, Lie not one to another, seeing that you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created Now let me tell you the first thing about being a Christian this evening. Being a Christian will change your life. Christians don't live filthy lives. I mean, what this passage says is you used to do that. But you don't do that anymore. And I want to tell you tonight that I believe being a Christian can change your life. I don't care what kind of life you live. I believe you can be born again, raised to walk in newness of life. 
all that doesn't mean that we might not lapse into sin. It doesn't mean that we might not fall. And we have an advocate with the Father when we do. But it means you can change the course and character of your life. I believe that's a lesson that the world needs to hear even this week. That Christians are people that are committed to live right God life. And that what Colossians the third chapter teaches us is that we can do that. And I, I will challenge you if you're in this audience this evening and you're not a Christian that you ought to come and watch these people here. And I believe that what you will see is you will see people that don't lie and that don't cheat and that don't talk filthy out of their mouth and who are not born again. That's a challenge for those of us who are Christians and it's a challenge for those of us who are here, but it's a challenge that clearly the Scriptures place upon us. And that is to say that when you're a Christian, you're different. But I want to tell you something this evening while I'm there. And that is I've preached a lot of lessons in my life telling people that they had to behave themselves. And that if we're going to be Christians, we're not going to be fornicators and we're not going to be liars and we're not going to be blasphemers and so forth. But I, that's not what I'm preaching about tonight. I'm not going to tell you that you can't do those things. What I'm talking about tonight is how not to do them. Oh, somebody said, oh, it's hard. How can we ever get where we master all of those things? Well, I believe we're just sitting right on top of how to do that. I've preached a lot around young people in my life because I've always taught in universities and I've always been around young people. And I've had a lot of folks invite me in the course of time to come and speak to young people about how to behave. And so I've given a lot of thought to how can we get young people to behave like they ought to. And I've come up with several good ideas. I thought, I thought one time that what we need to do is build two concentration camps. One for boys and one for girls. But I have had decided that that probably wouldn't work. That they probably would find some way to crawl out of there. Well, how can you get them to behave? And as I've said through the years, I've uh, tried to raise five children. Every time one of my daughters would get to be about 16, I'd begin to worry about that. Say to myself, what am I going to do with this girl? You know, I know in another eight or ten years she'll want to go out with boys. And <laughs> what is she going to do when she dies? And I'll tell you the answer to that question. I'll tell you what she's going to do. She's going to do just what she wants to do. That's what she's going to do. And I'll tell you this. If you behave yourself when you're 16, or if you behave yourself when you're 6, it'll be because you're a Christian. And because you got your affections set on things above you. And there isn't but one way, finally, that we get our lives straight, and that is if we get our minds straight. And we're risen with Christ, and we say, I'm going to live my life because Christ is living in me. Think of the damage that I do <coughs> to His name when I bring reproach upon Him. And think of how it violates the very nature of who I am, that I am Christ. What is it that it's worth taking my eyes off and going to hell for some kind of sin that be fun enough that I'd miss going to hell? No. I mean, when we lapse into immorality, what we've done is we've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten where we're going. And that's exactly what the Lord says is the direction that ought to keep us on course. Well, let me tell you the second thing I believe it'll do for you. If we keep reading verse 11, where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. 
put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, vows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. To the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. I will tell you this evening how we can be a fruitful, productive, happy, peaceful body of Christ. And just exactly by getting in mind the things that we got in front of us this evening. He says, I will, I, I'll tell you that what you need to do is you all need to be meek and peaceful and loving among one another and nobody needs to think he's better than anybody else because in the body of Christ there's neither Greek nor Jew nor Barbarian nor Scythian nor bond nor free but everybody's just one in Christ and we're all just working for the same cause. I, I will tell you what makes a good productive Christian what makes a good productive church is for everybody just to say I'm doing it for Christ and I'm doing it because I want to go to heaven I had an interesting thing happen not too long before I left Arkansas this last time the young preacher out there Steve Gawthon who is a fine fellow goes to the church building real early every morning to work and he told me a story one day. He had gone down to the building real early one day and he, and he heard the water run in the building. And he was afraid somebody had left a tap on or something, so he began to look around. He looked all downstairs, finally went upstairs and couldn't find anything. He walked out the front door. And out in front of the building, we had two planters out there. And we had, of course, a good crop of weeds in them. And what he found early that morning at 6 o'clock was a young couple that were real quiet young people and I didn't know them very well myself because they kind of sat back in the back and didn't say much. But they were out there and they had dug those weeds up and planted flowers. They were watering the flowers. And when he told me that I told him, I said, well Steve, I said, I, I can think of two really wonderful things about that story. And the first one is, I am so glad they did that and we didn't have to have a business meeting to try to decide what to plant out there or it would have taken us too much, you know. But I said, I will tell you the other thing that really makes me happy about it is why they did it. That they just did it. Because it was something they could do for the Lord. And they wanted to do it, not because anybody told them to do it, or not because they had to do it, or not even because anybody was going to know they did it. But they did it because of who they were, and because they wanted to do what they could do in the service of the Lord. And I will tell you when we will get it done is when everybody acts just exactly on those motives. And when we understand that what we need is we don't just need people doing one kind of thing and it's not as if it's the only people that are important or the barbarians or the Scythians or bond or free, but that everybody's one in Christ and we act because we're Christian and because we're trying to go to heaven. Well, verse 16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You ever worry about whether your worship is all that it ought to be? Whether it becomes too routine, not as fruitful as the Lord had? had? I, I go places to preach sometimes and a lot of times a young person will come up to me and say something like, Brother Harold, I, I'll tell you, this church is just dead. And, you know, these same old people just sit in these same old seats and sing these same old songs and say those same old prayers, and it just doesn't mean a thing. 
And I'll tell you what I always tell those young people. I say, well, now that's a pretty hard judgment to make, you know. And my guess is that a lot of those old people that sit in those same old seats and say those same old prayers probably mean them every time they say them. And if you told them the next time they came and said them you were going to shoot them, that they'd come anyhow. So we better not make those judgments like But the other side of that is, I have to tell you that I have preached in some places where I sure did wonder about it too. I've preached a few places where I kind of felt like waving my hands about halfway through to see if anything was alive out there. <laughs> but the question is, if our, if our worship is not what it ought to be, how do you solve it? What can we do about it? And I, I've been places where people propose some pretty superficial solutions. Some of say, oh, what we need to do is we need to all sit around in a circle. We need to turn the lights down low. Well, I want to tell you, I have met nearly every. I've met at my house and other people's houses and in the courthouse and the store buildings and the jail house. We sat in circles and in the windows in good light and bad light. But I'll tell you that. If you got a bunch of dead Christians and you sit them around in a circle and turn the lights down low, you'll have a bunch of dead Christians that can't see each other very well. That's all. You want to solve anything. Because that's not what makes true worship. But what makes true worship be? If you sing with grace in your heart unto the Lord. If you worship knowing who you are and where you're going. If we worship as unto the Lord. And that's what we need to think about when we come to do it. And that's what our hearts need to be full of. My father was a physician. And he was a great old fellow, and he did a lot for Christian people. And among other things, he helped start a congregation in my sister's house down in Jacksonville, Florida, and they started with about six or seven people. And uh, before he died, there were maybe 200, 250 of them. And he had helped a lot of them financially and in other ways too. But as he got old, he got hard of hearing, and he got cantankerous. Actually, he'd always been kind of because you got more kind of But he would sit right down here on his front seat. And my friend Harold Daddy, that preached his congregation, I love my daddy just like his own dad. And Harold would come and stand right in front of my daddy so daddy could hear it. He'd sit there with his hearing aid and he'd hold his hand behind his ear and Harold would stand right in front of him. And two or three, on two or three occasions, the, uh, a preacher came in and they forgot to tell him about that. And he'd get up behind the pulpit and start preaching. And about the time he did, my daddy waved to him and point and come stand down there. <laughs> well, those people put up with that. They were they were good to him. But he'd been good to them, and it was good for them, everybody. But when my dad died. Uh, at the grave side. One of the deacons in that congregation came up to me. He said he was a young lawyer. He came up to me after the service and he said, Ed, he said, I want to tell you something about your daddy. He said, your daddy taught me a lot of things. But he never taught me anything that meant more to me than just watching struggle to come to service those last few years. Well, I'll teach you something about how to worship God. I mean, I'll tell you when you worship be all in all the best. It's when you see the end of that road and you know who you are. You know why you lived your life. And when you got your eyes set on where you're going, and that's what Colossians 3 says. That you want your worship to be what it ought to be, that's just like you want your life to be what it ought to be. Then get your mind where it ought to be. 
Say, I'm a Christian. That's why I'm here. That's why I sang these songs. And I'm on my way to heaven. Verse 17 said, And whatsoever you do, word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God in the Father by Him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as unto the Lord, and not unto me. Now, I want to tell you that what we got before us is the answer to all questions in life. Whatever you do, do it having been risen with Christ. Knowing that you're a Christian. Showing your way to heaven. And I'll tell you what that'll do. That'll make a good wife out of it. And it'll make a good husband out of it. And it'll make good parents out of it. And it'll make good children. And it'll make good employees out of you. And it'll make good employers out of you. It'll make good citizens out of you. It'll make good people out of you. And it'll make you have a good life. I mean, the answer to every question is that we need to understand who it is we are and what it is the Lord wants us to be. I'll tell you what you wives need to do. You need to submit yourselves unto your own husbands in all things. And I will tell you why you need to do that. You need to do that because your husband is always right. Well, maybe not. Actually, he may not always be right. I'll tell you why you need to do it. You need to do it because it is right. And you do it because of who you are. And if I am Christ, then I do what the Lord would have me to do. And I'll tell you, husband, what you need to do. You need to love your wife. And I'm like, I heard Sewell preaching not too long ago, and he said that he hoped that he had heard for the last time in his life, but he was sure that he hadn't. That old saying when some young man comes up to him and says, Oh, Brother Hall, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't love my wife anymore. But he said, I got the answer now. And the answer is, well, repent then and do it. I mean, if we ever want to read a command, we've got a command there, don't we? That is, husbands love your wife. Doesn't say love her if she still looks like she did 30 years ago, which is unlikely, and it's unlikely you do either. Or that she cooks my breakfast like I like it. She does everything else. Now you may, uh, she may do an awful lot of good things for you, and there are a lot of good reasons to love our wives. But I'll tell you finally what we do. We do what we do because it's right for us to do. And I'm honest not because I have to be or not because it'll influence people, but I'm honest because of who I am. And I believe that finally what that does is it makes every relationship right. I'll tell you, there, there are a lot of things I'm not very good at. And I, I have said through the years that I'm glad that we're not all the same in the body of Christ, that there are barbarians and Scythians and Jews and Greeks and bond and free because my wife does a lot of things better than I do. And we kind of divide responsibilities. She'll have to come with me sometime because her responsibility is remembering names. And uh, and that's awfully hard for me. She's good at comforting the sick and 
and she can go visit the hospital and I'm terrible at it. I don't like to do it. I've never been sick and I never know what to do when I get there. I usually stumble around and say, well, I hope you don't die. And uh, they're glad to see me leave. Well, I, I have often said too that I, I don't think I'm a very good counselor in some ways because I'm strong-willed and someone comes to me and tells me, oh, I've got this terrible problem and I'm doing this and I know I ought not to be doing it and I just don't, I can't quit. And I might stumble around with that for a minute, but before long I'll say, well, if I was you, what I would do is I would just quit. Now let me tell you something about your life. Whatever your life is involved in, what you need to do is get control of it. And if it's wrong, quit it. And if you're not at behaving like you ought to in your family, you need to start it. And if you're not all that you ought to be in every facet of life, the reason is because you've never gotten straight who you are. And I urge you this evening to think about the strength that the Lord gives us and to suggest to you that if you want to solve your problems, what you need to do is just understand the basic transformation that the Lord said takes place in all of us when we become His children. Now the assurance that I want to tell you that that gives you in this audience this evening, if you're here and you're not a Christian, is that I believe that God has provided for us adequately that we not only can begin a new life, but that we can be complete in Him and we can finish it. And if you're here this evening and you would be a Christian, you need to begin that journey by confessing faith in Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins, being buried with the Lord in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life as people did in New Testament days. And then, if that transformation is genuine in your mind, and if you understand truly what you have done, that you have come to give your life to be hid in Christ, to glorify His cause, and if you'll keep your eyes set firmly on where you're going, then I believe that that prepares us for whatever it is we may have to face in life. And that what we do is we say, I will be what I ought to be because of what the Lord has given me the power to become. If you're in this audience and you're a child of God, you've lost your way we could urge you after the preaching of this message to come back and find your bearings again. Get it straight who it is that you are and get your sights set again on going to heaven. What you need to do is confess your wrongs, pray that God forgive you, repent of it. He's promised that he'll do that for his children. You're in this audience, subject to the invitation. We could encourage you to come. We invite you while we stand. Thank you.